All right, so let's finish up talking about, um, again, this is 1.3 B, C. Let's finish talking about some of our basic functions with some simple transformations. So we talked about how the natural log function, if I have natural log of X minus two, it shifts the graph over two to the right. And so the domain changes. The range still stays all real numbers. Now, again, when you do your homework, I'm expecting you to just straight up graph it, right? And you'll see, oh, look, the domain, there's this vertical asymptote here at two, right? For part B, the hyperbola that's been shifted down four, you can see one, two, three, four. Oh, look, there's my new horizontal asymptote at y equals negative four. So my range is all y values except negative four. Um, the parabola and the square root function that have been shifted over um, that we briefly talked about. So again, with my parabola, because it was already all real numbers in my domain, when I shift it, there's no change in the domain or the range. Um, when I look at my square root function, again, what you would probably do is exactly this, put them in your calculators and we see what's the domain and range of this function. Domain's all reals, range is from zero to infinity. What's the domain and range here? Well, the domain is from zero to infinity and the range is four up to infinity. Um, when you look at cosine, right, of x minus two, what I had for you here was, it's just gonna shift all of cosine over by two. So again, no change in the domain, it's still all real numbers, but your range, right, because cosine normally is bounded above and below by one and negative one, similarly. So pause the video right now on your own, see if you can predict, right, kind of do what we did by hand first, what do you think e to the x minus three should look like? So pause your video. Okay, so, y equals e to the x, right? That is one of our basic functions. And when x is zero, e to the zero is one. When x is one, e to the one is e. So one, two, that's like 2.7. That's about right here. And it grows. And yet there's this asymptote here and you've got the left-sided end behavior going towards zero. So you've got the horizontal asymptote y equals zero. So my original basic function, right, the domain was or is all real numbers, and my range is from zero up to infinity, right? Y must be strictly greater than zero. What is this minus three doing? That minus three y equals e to the x minus three. Did you guess it's gonna shift all the y values down, right, because it's happening outside of my function? Sure is, and that's what happens. Instead of h equaling zero being the asymptote, one, two, three, at negative three, that's where your vertical asymptote, not vertical, sorry, your horizontal asymptote at y equals negative three. That's where you're going to be. When you plug in zero, we're going to have one. E to the zero is one minus three is negative two, right? At one, it's going to be, sorry, that's, yeah, when E is one, this is E, two point something minus three is a little bit less than, right, zero. And so we grow and we decrease. And so what is our domain? Well, it's still all real numbers, right? Nothing changed there. But what is the range? The range, ah, instead of y being strictly greater than zero, y must be strictly greater than negative three because it's all been shifted down. So you might say, or it's from negative three to infinity. That's my range in interval notation. And again, you can see those in your calculator if you graph them, right? So here's cosine minus two, right? Here it's been shifted over two units. Here, e to the x minus three, it's been shifted down three units. And your absolute value function plus three, what would you predict? Well, it's gonna move it up three. So what is the domain and range of this function? The domain is all real numbers. The range is y must be greater than or equal to three. It's been shifted up. Right. 
Last but not least, what about sine of 4x? So again, what does sine of x look like usually? Well, usually sine of x, sine of 0 is 0, sine of pi over 2 is 1, sine of pi is 0, sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, right? These are all things you should have memorized, right? Sine of 2 pi is back to 0. And so you have one nice complete cycle like that. So what happens if I multiply my whole function by 4? 4 times sine of x. Well, suddenly... 0, sine of 0 is still 0, right? So I'm still starting here at the origin. But what's pi over 2? Sine of pi over 2 is 1. 1 times 4 is now not 1, but 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm trying to keep the same scale as what I had here. Suddenly, at pi over 2, I'm way up here, right? Then at pi, I'm 0 again. Then at 3 pi over 2, I'm running out of paper, right? So one, two, three, negative four, right? I'm way down. So four is called the amplitude of your trig function. That is totally not accurate. I'm about to show you what your graphing calculator did, right? But the point is this is going to stretch, stretch. It's going to change the y values and stretch your graph. So what's your domain? Well, it's still all real numbers, just like it was here. It's your range that's now going to change. Here, my sine function, the range, is from negative 1 to 1. But when you multiply everything by 4, that's going to change your range to be negative 4 to positive 4. Your y values get stretched. So again, this is what your graphing calculator would give you, right? So one, two, three, four, it's up so much higher. One, two, three, negative four, it's stretched down so much more. So those are what our functions look like, all right? And how we find the domain and the range from them. So let's move on now and talk again about continuous functions. And here is the official Definition of what does it mean for a function to be continuous at a point A? Definition, right? So a function f of x is continuous at a point x equals A if the limit as x approaches A of my function. So again, whenever you see this, think the limit of the y values, right? What are the y values? f of x, these are the y values. What are my y values doing as x approaches A? Now, this whole expression right here only makes sense when the limit as x approaches a from the left, from below, from below your function, is in fact equal to the limit as x approaches a from above f of x. When these are equal, then this limit is defined and it makes sense. If the limit does not agree from both sides, if they're going to different things, it can't be continuous, right? This expression doesn't even make sense. And this limit needs to equal where the function is defined at A. So again, if A is not in your domain, F of A doesn't exist because A wouldn't be in the domain. So again, this piece is basically saying A must be in the domain must be in the domain of your function. So those removable discontinuities that we had, those holes in the lines, right? The limit from the left and the limit from the right were the same, but if you had a hole, it's because that value of A wasn't in your domain. So again, fact to be proven in calculus, all polynomial, rational, root, and trig functions are continuous on their domains. So we can just take for granted, they're all on our domains. They're all continuous for each a, for each x equal a in their domains. So what are the ones that we have to worry about? Piecewise defined functions. So a piecewise defined function basically is a function that uses different functions in different parts of the domain. So let's look below at a pretty 
classic simple example. So I'm going to zoom out a smidge so we can see this. So example two says, determine if each piecewise defined function is continuous for all real numbers. So f of x is equal to x squared when x is less than zero, and it's equal to x cubed when x is greater than or equal to zero. So is this function going to be continuous for all real numbers? Well, since each piece is a polynomial, since this piece here is a polynomial and this piece here is a polynomial, then each piece is continuous on its domain, right? That's what our fact above just said. So the only thing we need to worry about with this piecewise function is the end point or the break point in the domain. Where is my domain being broken up? At zero. Because for all the x values less than zero, I'm looking at a parabola. For all the values of x that are greater than or equal to zero, I'm looking at my cubic function. So how do we determine if f is continuous at that breakpoint? We look at and use our definition. Right? So if we look at this definition again, we need to show that the limit as x approaches, in this case, zero of my function exists, which means we need to look at it from the left and from the right. And then we need to make sure it actually is equal to what it should be defined as. So what does that mean? All right. Is f continuous at x equals zero? Well, what is the limit as x approaches zero from the left, from below zero, from a little less than zero? That's what that little negative sign up here means again. So where, what piece of my function do I use when x is a little less than zero? I use this blue piece that I highlighted. I'm going to use x squared. So I rewrite this as the limit as x goes to zero from the left of x squared. Well, what is that? As x goes to zero, that's kind of like zero squared. You can just kind of directly substitute it in. Zero squared is zero. How about from above zero, from the right of zero? For x greater than zero, I'm going to use x cubed. And lo and behold, zero cubed is still zero. So they agree. What does this mean? This means that the limit as x approaches zero of f of x is defined and it's equal to zero. And since f of zero, if I plug zero into this function, which piece do I use? I use the piece where it says or equal to. That's x cubed. So zero cubed is zero. So according to the definition of continuousness at a point, the limit as x approaches zero of f of x is equal to f of zero. So f is continuous at x equals zero also. So since it's continuous for all x less than zero and it's continuous for all x greater than zero, since these two functions are themselves continuous on their domains, and since it's continuous at zero, it's continuous for all real numbers. Now that is using the definition of continuity to show that this piecewise function is continuous for all real numbers. Would you like to see the quicker, less painful way of showing that it is continuous for all real numbers? Oh no, what happened? Yeah, this got shifted over. Yes, ready to see the shorter way? Okay, here we go. We graph it. So, looky here. Your parabola, when x is less than zero, right, is going to, at negative 2, it's 4, at negative 1, it's 1, at 0, it's 0, but I'm going to put a hole there for right now because it's not equal to 0. So there's my parabola. How do I graph my cubic function? Well, at 0, it equals 0. Oh, so I'm going to fill in that hole, and right away I can see the left side and the right side agree, right? They both go to 0. 1, and then up here is going to be where 2 cubed is, so it's growing much taller. And just from the picture, just from my graph, I can see in one continuous movement, I can draw my graph. But again, for x less than 0, it's a parabolic curve, whereas for x greater than or equal to 0, it's a cubic, much growing much steeper curve. So try to do example 2 on your own now. Go ahead, pause, and in fact, That'll be it for this video. Try this on your own, and then I'll go over it in my next video.